fabulous. Um, okay, so um, a kind of introductory session about the research today. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about myself, how I've got to where I am, um, why for me co-creation is important within this, and then some of the, I guess, some of the difficulties with definitions, with measurements, um, with accessing services um, within higher education. So, um, quick bit about um, before we begin. So, it's important to remember that the, these workshops are, although we're focusing on mental health um, and looking at how this is assessed and how it's measured, we're not looking at your mental health per se. So, although I'm very interested in that and I hope everyone is well, these aren't the spaces or places to talk about your own mental health, okay? So we're interested in looking at how this is measured. So you're in control of whether you want to be here or not, whether you want to take part, whether you want to answer anything. Um, there are a few kind of short and easy questions to engage people today, as Joe mentioned. Um, and I would always say, if you are in need of any support, then access this from your university um, or any other kind of support mechanisms that you know that are in place. So uh, it's kind of key to remember there are no right and wrong answers um, today and throughout the workshops. Um, for some things, there may not well be an answer or a straightforward one. And I guess that's also part of the, um, the topic, part of the discussion that hopefully we will have over the next few weeks. So just remember this is a safe space. Um, we are discussing topics that, um, that may be delicate, that may be very personal. So treat everyone with respect. Um, I'm only collecting data through screenshots. So um, anything or everything is anonymous. So your name won't appear on anything. Um, I'm not too sure about this session with this one, but you can ask me uh, a question at any time. Probably today's probably that's less relevant. Um, and a, a key thing that I know we've a lot of people have been uh, stuck at home for a long, long time now working like this with IT. Um, it's important to acknowledge that just sometimes IT can be very difficult and frustrating, and I'm sure things will go wrong today. So uh, I'm going to try and use something called Mentimeter. I can almost certainly guarantee that it won't work, um, and that will be my frustrations with IT, I guess. The, oh, well, I guess before we go on from that, is, there, is that all okay with everyone? Um, Joe, are we okay to have like a thumbs up with stuff like this or are we just kind of taking that as a given? Yeah, we do have the chat so you can um, use that to express anything or ask any oh, um, sort of yeah. um, urgent questions and you can use the kind of reactions within Zoom. Great, lovely. Oh yeah, thank you everyone. Uh, okay. So, uh, short little bit about me. Um, so I have um, a visual arts kind of background. So I did uh, a BA in fine art. Um, I then kind of a few years later went, went back to university and did an MA um, in contemporary theater and performance. So um, I became less employable almost as, <laughs> as the qualifications came. Um, Obviously, a couple of years after all of this, I realized I still needed to pay rent. So I did my first bit of retraining. Um, I did a PGCE. Um, I then taught for uh, about 10 years. Um, then I retrained as um, a counselor. Um, and I'm currently working in a higher education institution in the Northeast. Uh, in that role. And then uh, last year, I decided to do some more training, some more further education. So 
Uh, I started a PhD and um, interestingly or not, that PhD is in the design faculty. So um, I think you would term me multidisciplinary, I think. So this is kind of um, where I'm at uh, with all of these things. So um, um, probably unsurprisingly with, the, with that background, um, got an interest in mental health, obviously. Um, and this is kind of, it's becoming more and more uh, prevalent, would you say, within higher education? Um, so the awareness of mental health is rising in the general population. Um, with that, perhaps there is a, a growing rise in people seeking support for their own mental health. Um, that certainly was the case before COVID. It most certainly is now, um, and kind of the the kind of most current up to date kind of literature would suggest um, that students have uh, suffered the most from COVID and the restrictions and the isolation, and that um, mental health for students is a key issue. And there are there's quite a lot going on now currently with. Um, office for national for students kind of putting out projects and money to kind of uh, work with this there's the student mental health charter that's also kind of um, up and running around this and trying to kind of um, put mental health more at the center of how a university how higher education deals with this and approaches the issue of mental health um, short little uh, quick bit for the chat oh somebody has already filled one in. Um, so on average, um, how many people will have experienced a common mental health disorder in the past week? Anybody um, want to hazard a guess at that? So um, a common mental health disorder is something like uh, anxiety, depression. Um, so if we want to use chat, take a wild guess if you like. Uh, a, B, or C. Oh. Okay, so a few, couple of Bs and an A as well. Okay. <laughs> okay, so far one person has got it. Two. Uh, okay. Okay, the last person I can see on there is. Oh. <laughs> King John got it. So why these kind of all now fly in? Um, perhaps a rather depressing stat with all of this. Uh, one in six people um, in the past week will have um, experienced a common mental health disorder. So the prevalence of it is um, high. And um, how we support this and how we approach this and kind of um, find services for this and fund them are all key at this time. So um, at the bottom here, we've, we've got research title. So creating with intangible context, I like what does this mean? Who, um, I guess it's trying to work out and work with and explore how people can share things that are intangible, their emotions, affective things that are going on for them, and how, it, how they can be in control of that, how they share their information. And we'll look a little bit more and over the, few, the following weeks how that's actually done. Um, 
So my research question, the thing I'm interested in, how can we supplement already existing mental health forms, assessment forms, not just through text, not just through written word, but with a kind of more embodied kind of approach to this. So embodied that, get some examples of what that might be. And co-creation then, what is this? Um, hopefully the title kind of explains it. So I'm interested in hearing your voices. So what is it that's relevant now for you as students? What are key things, key priorities for you? And what is it that you would want to be telling mental health staff, professionals about what, how do you, how do you share your story essentially? And co-creation, according to the Student Minds Handbook, provides opportunities for students to provide uh, their opinions, perspectives, experiences, ideas, and concerns. So you're the voice of experience group through this. Um, it's a chance for you to say, Luke, your ideas are absolutely rubbish. Here's some better ones. And here's how we think you might be able to use them. So over the uh, following weeks, uh, we will kind of look at a key theme or key, key topic each week, um, hopefully delve in in a bit of detail about what they are, explore kind of what some of the key issues might be around all of those and, and relate this to you. And these are some of the uh, some of the tools and approaches that we've got. So I'm going to try and use Mentimeter, as I've mentioned. We'll use Jamboard for post-it notes, sharing ideas, and we'll approach the we'll approach this as rather than something about you personal. We'll use scenarios, personas, and speculative design. So I'll have an example of that at the end to show kind of what that actually is and what that what that means. So these are key themes that I'm interested in. Um, so we've got um, the, the lead in time, kind of those, what is essentially waiting times. So you fill out your assessment form, you want to kind of get some support, and then you just kind of, you, you, you have to wait. Um, what's happening in that time? Like, can that time be useful? How do you access things that self-help, for example? What is it that might be useful to take with you into counselling sessions, for example? What is it that you want to record and share? Next week, week three, we'll look at this concept of a digital therapeutic relationship. So there's been a huge rise, obviously, in kind of um, well, tech, but mental health apps particularly. Um, how are they used? What are their advantages? What might their disadvantages be? And then fourth week, we'll be looking at the impact of the environment. So for a lot of people going to university, it's maybe their first time away from home. It's somewhere new. There can be a lot of stress involved. Um, how do you navigate all of that? Where do you find support in all of that? And so they're the kind of key themes for each week. So we'll, we'll kind of look at those in more depth with the, as, we, as we explore them and see kind of really what, what are, might some of the issues be around some of those things and what might be some of the uh, opportunities with that. Um, and so I've just kind of outlined here in the box kind of the crux of all of this really. We're kind of looking at how mental health and well-being are measured. That has an impact on the service that, that you may or may not access. And it's also about sharing personal information and your data. How do you want that to be used? Do you know how it's shared? Um, and 
in terms of my research, I'm interested in that experiential embodied physical experience. So not just a written form or not just necessarily even just a verbal language. How do you share something else? How do you share that embodied experience? Do you want to share that? Uh, so this is the context that we're talking about. So this is a kind of um, all kind of um, counselling mental health service within HE. So um, the resources are tight. Almost every kind of higher education institution will offer time limited service. So that there's a range but that's usually somewhere between four and six sessions. So really what happens is you kind of are not feeling great. You, that might be going on for a few weeks, might even go on for months, and you think, actually, I'm going to refer to the service. I'm going to get some help. <clears throat> you get in touch. They send you a link. They assign you a form. You send it back. They send you a link to book. Um, sessions, first session. So there's this back and forth already going on. Then once you've done all that, you kind of get put in a waiting list. Um, this is really dependent on area. You might be seen in a few days. Within higher education, it's probably likely to be a few weeks. If you were trying to access NHS, something like IAP, then this is likely to be uh, a couple of months. Um, so we've got this kind of back and forth and we've got this huge amount of time where people might just be waiting. And it's um, how can we use that productively? How can we use that in a way that's going to be beneficial? How can we design something that's useful? And how do we get that information? So what's useful for me might not necessarily be useful for you. Um, so this is my first little experiment with Mentimeter. So I would suggest doing this via phone. So if you go to menti.com, and I think it's relatively simple, go to menti.com and then add your code, which is 5178. 2097 and hopefully you should be able to see a question that's about what do you what might you access while you're waiting would you be all right to post that code in the chat for us yep Oh, sorry, everyone. Okay. And if for some reason this doesn't work, you could always just put it in the chat. So where might you seek support while you're waiting? Or what form might that support be? Okay, I have no idea if that worked at all. Perhaps not. Joe, did you have any luck with it? 
I had some, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, I can see. One person, thank you. Okay, so, um, can I just check that we've moved on to the next slide, Joe? Mm -hmm. Lovely, thank you. So, one of the key things that, um, that is important when we're talking about this is actually how do we how do we define it how do we understand it how do we know what mental health is how do we know what well-being is and then um one thing that i'll put up at the end is a link to um different forms that we're going to look at and maybe get some opinions on um what's currently in use So this one may or may not work. Um, so we're going to look at what's mental health and well-being. And so are they the same? So maybe this is this can just go in the chat. Um, there is a menti page for this. I don't know if this one will work. Um, oh, okay. It's nice to know that some things work. Um, For you, um, is mental health the same as well-being, or is it different? And kind of, or are you unsure? Or maybe, maybe not. So, if we go to the Menti page, we can add this in, or if you want to just put in the chat. If you think, is mental health the same as well-being or is it different? Um, we could just see maybe where people are with that and their definitions of what they think it is. So the Menti page is up. Is mental health the same as well-being? Yes, no, maybe, unsure. And if you can't get to that, then put it in the chat. Okay, a lot of people thinking uh, that, that it's different or they're definitely not the same. Okay. Thanks, Henry. Henry thinks it's very different. Okay, well, they go through. So, um, we'll just look at kind of two or three kind of different definitions. So there's the first one, the, the kind of pyramid. This is uh, from student minds. So this is how they kind of talk about um, mental health. So we've got this pyramid and at the top we have mental illness. Mental illness will be a, a diagnosed kind of condition. Below that, you have a mental may have a mental health problem. Below that, mental distress. Below that, no distress or no problem. That's very nice. The key thing is to remember that these aren't mutually exclusive. So you can have one and another one happening at the same time. You can have one and not the other happening 
at the same time. Um, it gets more tricky when you try and define them in, in kind of um, greater language. So the World Health Organization, they define mental health as a state of well-being um, in which individual abilities, this kind of quote here. Um, it gets tricky because now in the definition is well-being. So we'll see later on why that's difficult. The important thing to remember around all of this is that everybody has mental health. Mental health is, is something that everyone has. Sometimes it may be great, sometimes it may not be so great, but mental health is something that we all have. So then we have here a couple of definitions of well-being. So quite often well-being is talked about in dimensions or wheels or here we have a, a, a well-being wheel these are the kind of things that make up well-being there isn't a kind of all-encompassing definition of what well well-being actually is though so the world health they well with world health organization link health with well-being so it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and that's not, it. It doesn't have to have disease or infirmity. So, well-being is often uh, a more positive outlook when it's being measured. The difficulty is that this is all subjective. So, how you measure well-being is your opinion at the time and it's the same with assessment forms when you're accessing a service you are ticking a box or you're matching a descriptor at that time so these are these become difficult because this is then impacts on how services are funded might be inform how policy is then kind of um, put in place. And it's also how you measure success and how you evidence the success. And so these are some of the things that we find with when we use assessment forms to access a service. So the advantages kind of there on the, on the left, so they help with triage, they start the process and engagement, so they get that ball rolling. It can be very useful at, at um, providing a comparison from when you started to when you end. And it clearly provides statistics. This is really important when you get to funding. So some of the things that are that come up as disadvantages, so when you fill in that form, it's however you feel on that day. It's a real snapshot in time. It doesn't give you anything, um, doesn't give you the context, doesn't give you what's happening. It's just, this is it today at this moment in time. They can be time consuming to fill in. That, that can then become annoying if you're doing it every session and it's taking up your time. The key thing for me that I find uh, when I when I work is actually people fill in these forms and you get a set of numbers and actually the numbers tell you very little. So what does a number actually mean? And then, of course. They're only as useful as the person fills it in allows or only as useful as the form allows. So you have to fit to a descriptor. You have to tick a box to say, um, this one, this one, this one. And so there, there's nothing personalized about them. And really, if I would say simply, what do I want to do? What do I want to do in my research? I just want to find out or explore if there's a better way to do this. How might we kind of, um, 
how might you want to record what's happening in your life and how might you want to share that for accessing a service for building a relationship with somebody that might support you on your journey and I spoke a little bit briefly about kind of speculative design or exploring how we might do that and this little image here is one way so where a form might ask you how have you been feeling this past week here in this image this is my sighing for the week so there are seven balloons here each one is the collection of the size that I've made in the day. They might be positive, they might be great size of enjoyment, they might be size of frustration. Not necessarily saying this is a better way of, of uh, measuring or collecting any of this, but this is a different way and it's an embodied way. Um, I want to see if there's something useful with this. I want to see if uh, through co-creation, if there's um, ideas that people have about how they might want to share that embodied experience. Um, I'm not too sure how relevant this is right for now, but if you do have any feedback, um, just let me know. There are some sources of support here. Access them if you need them. The final slide was just something that uh, is looking towards the kind of next few weeks, what we might do. So um, using Jamboards to look at some of the assessment forms that are currently used. So if you if you do want to follow the link, you can look at the Jamboard, you can make some notes or just look at the kind of things that we want to do. Um, so I think that's kind of um that's kind of the key bits joe